Good afternoon. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is John Murph. I'm a music journalist and a DJ based in Washington, D.C. Um, and I want you to help me welcome the wonderful Patricia Barber from Washington, I'm uh, not Washington, uh, Chicago. She's a great pianist and a great songwriter and a vocalist and one of my all time heroes. Oh. Wow. Thank so, you. can I give a round of applause? Thank you. So you <laughs> So you just landed in Washington DC. Is this your No, you performed here before, right? Yes, I've yes. I've been in Washington DC. Not not often. Okay. Uh, is this your first time performing with the DC Jazz Festival? It is. Okay. Well, welcome to our fair city and there's so much going on. It's, you have the Caps game, you have Prince's birthday, you've been 60 and you have uh, DC Gay Pride, and it is Black Music Month. So it's a lot going on in Washington, D.C. Okay. Um, I guess my first question is, um, you, you were talking about your songwriting, and you brought your songbooks. And one of the things I really love about your music, it, it has such a literary bite. It's like, I, I love the fact that your songs make us think. And... I've always wanted to ask this, like, what have you been reading lately that has been filtering into your, um, your music? Lately, I, uh, you know, I'm, I started this song cycle, Angels, Birds, and I, and I opened a new music festival in Chicago with uh, four of those songs. And I started that song cycle, uh, and then... In the middle of it, after I wrote Higher, uh, Renee Fleming came into the club, into the Green Mill, as she, as she does here and there to have a glass of wine and relax and enjoy the music. But this time, she uh, really wanted to hear, she had on her iPhone specifically, some songs she wanted to hear. So, um, so what happened is I had been leaning toward uh, more harmony, richer harmony, and richer uh, lyrics more uh, in the style of poetry mm -hmm. than song lyrics and, and a kind of a tighter knitting together of the two into what became an art song. Mm -hmm. and that's when Renee became interested and so we, we did a little thing together and I've been continuing that song cycle. So I just finished uh, one of those songs called uh, Pallet Angel mm -hmm. and that will be essentially my Christmas song. Oh, it wow. barely mentions Christmas. But that will be my Christmas song, and um, and now I'm interested, in fact, in birds. I've been reading as much as I possibly can about birds, and noticing birds, and uh, really trying to continue the theme of the song cycle that I started, uh, Angels, Birds, and I. And uh, so I, I would really have been learning about birds and reading as much as I possibly can. Okay. Um, Touch upon some of the things you said, uh, just for the sake of the audience. When you mention an art song, exactly what does that mean to a layman who just? There, everybody has, I think, a personal definition of an art song. You would think of Schumann and Schubert would be the, the you know, the the art songs of that period. And then I am particularly drawn to French art songs of, say, foray, piano and voice. Um, JBC wrote some beautiful art songs, Beausoir, Ravel wrote some uh, wonderful art songs, Chanson, uh, Ronaldo Hahn wrote some beautiful art songs. So in, in, in my business, when the harmony became rich enough and the lyrics became tied uh, very tightly to the, the structure, the skeleton of the song, um, then I didn't need a rhythm section as much. It could. It really could have been done. Uh, I can do it by myself, piano and voice, or I can play the piano and Renee Fleming could sing it, or another opera singer could sing it, or another jazz singer could sing it. But what you don't have is the drummer, mm. and you don't really need the rhythm. And so that, to me, distinguishes in my mind, coming from a jazz perspective, that would be an art song. So, looking back, I had been taking that path uh, since I had taken a short harmony, well, no, quite a few lessons of harmony with Shulamit Ron, a great composer. And I was able to open up harmony uh, into, uh, 
using a much richer, wider, broader palette uh, than the American classic songbook mm. jazz harmonic language, which is wonderful. How can you say it's anything but wonderful? Right. Um, but it is restricted. Okay. So, In terms of your songwriting, it's interesting hearing you talk about that. Um, and I'm not sure if you have just like this one strict way of approaching a song. Like, do you start with melody? Do you start with um, lyrics? Or do you start with harmony? Because you're talking about harmony so much right now. It seems like you're really, really exploring this realm of harmony as well. Yeah, I wish that I had a, a methodology. If mm -hmm. I had a methodology, I think I would write a book about how to write songs, and then I would just retire on that. Um, there is no one way for me to to start a song. Um, yes, you're right that I am very, very interested in harmony that is different from the traditional jazz harmony because it's broader, it's it's richer, um, and it's unexpected. Um, and so I I find that I I'm forging a path, let's say, um, and and giving jazz maybe some more area, some more, like, think of harmony as a landscape, I'm giving it a, a, a wider landscape. Mm. So I'm very interested in harmony. Um, sometimes, you know, a, a, a fun song can start with a, a lyrical uh, idea, uh, a hook, mm. if you will. Um, sometimes very chatty songs like Redshift or Postmodern Blues or Company, those songs uh, start with just an idea of something that I want to talk about, and if they're really chatty, then I have to. I feel that I need to make the music simpler. Um, personally, I'm not a fan of high modernism, so what I don't want is a very complicated lyric with very complicated music. Mm. Mm -hmm. So I try to do one or the other, but not both at the same time. Mm. So I, I and sometimes it's a, a rhythmic idea. It can be some something that I'd like, you know, a rhythmic thing I do on the bottom of the piano that starts a song. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's a, a very vague, romantic idea. Uh, and that's more been the case kind of lately. Okay. And you mentioned the birds. So have you always been fascinated with birds or is something just trigger this new um, exploration to birds. Yeah, no, I I have not always been interested in birds, even though I I love nature and uh, we have a kind of a farm out in Michigan, um, and I've always been interested in the forests and the trees. But I've been trying to learn as much as I can about it. And now that I'm awake to birds, I feel like I've been in a musical coma of sorts. I feel like because you know, well. Birders, mm -hmm. you know, they're extremely knowledgeable about birds, so I'm learning from them. Um, but uh, no, I, I'm just starting to learn about uh, birds, and um, I have many new passions. I have a new favorite bird every day, <laughs> you know? And, I, you know, I'm trying to learn the songs, I'm trying to identify the birds with binoculars, and I can't get the binoculars to work, and, mm -hmm. you know. Wow. Yeah. Uh, in terms of how like, you, see, you have this restive creative spirit, and when you're creating um, a song. And then sometimes, depending on if you're on a deadline or you have a grant, there's an end game. I'm also thinking about the whole idea of killing your darlings, like how you have to like keep rewriting a song. Like you don't want to get too, too attached to a song which you want to like, oh, I love the song, I need to kill it so I can do a better song. When do you know if a song is done? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that I could get lost in the research part mm. of these songs. And I have, mm -hmm. you know, get lost in the research part of writing these songs. As you say, they sometimes they're complicated and it takes, it quite, I feel that it needs a lot of research in order for me to make the metaphors uh, meaningful. You know, mm -hmm. I can make some stuff up, mm -hmm. you know, I can just use my imagination. But if, if you're going to deal with, let's say, astrophysics, I want the metaphors to be correct. I want to know. If, if I'm going to talk about how a star is born, I'm going to make that metaphor, I actually want to know, quite literally, how a star is born. Mm -hmm. And so then I need to study astrophysics. And um, sometimes I get stuck in that part uh, for a long, long time, mm -hmm. a year. You know, sometimes I get stuck there for a year just reading about 
the whatever it is, you know, I could eat your words. I was I didn't know how to cook, so I had to look up translative verbs about cooking, mm. you know. And then I got into like research about cooking, and um, I some somehow I I never feel that time is limiting me. I'm sure that it is. Mm. I'm sure that I function very much in the real world okay. like everybody else, but it it doesn't. Sometimes it, I have to remind myself that, mm. like you said. I, to actually start writing the song, you know, stop the research now and start writing the right. song. Um, but I did finish Pallet Angel and I did finish these songs, so I do eventually get them done. Um, okay. Um, I guess the flip side of that uh, that uh, question is, I was thinking about Wayne Shorter, and I'm just paraphrasing. Wayne Shorter has this way of thinking that a composition is never done. And I'm just thinking about how he has gone back in his uh, body of work and just done these dramatic sure. uh, rearrangements right. to the point where it's like you have to really know the song to even think about the originals. Right. And you have this incredible body of work. And I was thinking, have you ever gone to some of your old stuff like from Martin Cool? It's like, you know what? I should have done this with that lyric or would have done that with that harmony and just really want to like, kind of like explore your own body of work. I've been doing some of that lately, a little bit. Yeah, yes. Mm. Yes, I, I see your point, and yes, I've done a little bit of that, but I tend to more just keep going forward. Mm. I, I feel like there is a certain trajectory that I'm on. I can't explain what that trajectory is, but mm. I feel like I'm on it, mm -hmm. and I do feel like I need to continue down that path. Mm -hmm. So you're performing tomorrow at the City Winery. Mm -hmm. um, First of all, who are you going to be performing with? Is it going to be solo piano? Are you going to have um, a rhythm section? Are you going to have Charlie B? Who are you going to have with you? Uh, I have uh, uh, Patrick Mulcahy on bass and John Deitmeyer on drums. So okay. we've been traveling as a trio lately. Uh, without the fourth guest artist that I have on most of my records, and uh, it's really uh, where I should be. Mm. It's where I maybe should have been a few records ago. Um, there are a couple reasons that I, it took me a while to, I guess, step up and, and do the piano trio. One, I need, I need to be absolutely confident in my piano playing, mm -hmm. and I am. Mm -hmm. I can say now, finally, that I really am. Oh, wow. um, that's one thing. And, uh, and the other thing is that at the Green Mill, where I play on Monday nights, it's a really very long night. It's two huge 90-minute sets, which you know nobody does on the road. It's the longest night I have, so I need help. Okay. So I got used to having a fourth player just to help me, just to help me, uh, because I, I get too tired doing that. Mm. Um, mm. But on the road, it's been very successful, more successful, in fact, than uh, the quartet. Okay. Now, tomorrow, are you going to be uh, presenting some of the newer material, or are you going to be uh, working with Mostly songs that your audience knows. Like. Both. I okay. usually do a combination of things. Okay. Some covers, uh, some of my original songs, older original songs. But you know they are different now without a fourth player. Mm -hmm. So that is a rearrangement. Something like Orpheus that you remember mm -hmm. with a loud guitarist. Yeah. We don't have a guitarist now. So it's really interesting what John's done on the drums and what I do on the piano. So we have, in fact, rearranged some of that repertoire. Mm -hmm. And then you'll hear some new, brand new stuff. Okay. Yeah. So I'm, I think I did my research, and um, Smash was your last physical CD, and you've released uh, a digital recording uh, mm -hmm. live at the Green Mill after that. Right. Are you still interested in releasing physical CDs in this kind of changing time of the record in industry? Yeah, I, I would like to do, especially I would like to do this next one uh, as a studio CD uh, because it's such fine material, these art songs really need a silence in order for them to be uh, understood and heard. So I would definitely like to do a, a new uh, CD. And I've had, I've had some interest, uh, some mm. people ask, talking to me about it. Uh, so yeah, I, I am working on a new album, and I expect to record it maybe this winter, oh. to have it out in the spring okay. next year. Okay. You know, it's amazing, because I'm just thinking about, you're talking about your new record, and your first album came out uh, next year. Will be the 30th anniversary of S a Split, <laughs> and it's amazing. That Did you, you say that? 
Yeah, you did. All yeah. right, that's good. Uh, I'm a meaning in the yeah, best yeah. way no, because good. because there's so many people yeah. who have gone through through the industry who could not keep up, you know, and you've managed to ride the waves of so many different like changes in the jazz industry, in the record industry. You know, when Split came out, it was like these CDs were just now coming out. We weren't thinking about right, I, right. You know, digital True. and all yeah, that. Yeah. Um, given that, how have you navigated and just been able to remain who you are as an artist without having someone make you chase a fad? I say no a lot. You know that. I think you know that I say no a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's part of, you know, that's that's in a lot of the bios about me. I said no to Richard Seidel a long time ago with, you know, Polygram gave me that big call that everybody waits for. You know, Richard Seidel called and said, will you, you know, do the thing? Will you be the girl singer? Will you go around the world and get rich and famous? And and uh, I said, I th no. I said no. <laughs> I I had another idea that I wanted to write my own material, and uh, you know I've been saying no. I'm still saying no because uh, sometimes I have moderately severe asthma. There are places in the world I can't go, and I just won't go. And and increasingly there are more places I can't go because it is hotter. There are wildfires. There are, if the, if there's smoke I can't be there. Um, so the, increasingly, my tours are to clean air spots. You know, a lot of Scandinavia. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of Scandinavia. Right. So. Wow. Wow. And also. Uh, oh yeah. To, so to answer your question, how have I survived? Um, part of part of the uh, the true answer to that is, you know, I really just put my head down and, and work on the music, and it has to please me. And I can only hope that it pleases other people. But mm. I decided at the very beginning that if I write for anybody else's uh, approbation, if I write for success, if I write for money, uh, it will skew the music and it won't be something that I care about. Mm. And I have to care about it. And I really love music. I still love music. And it still gets me up in the morning. And... Um, so I think any artist, not just a musician, I really think that you have to, you know, it sounds silly, you have to be true to yourself. You have to be true to your mm -hmm. heart and soul. And so in, I don't know if I have survived. Have I survived these 30 years? I think so. Well, you know, I don't know. I don't know if you call this survival or if, you know, it's, it's a good thing that I saved my money. Mm -hmm. It's a good thing that I invested in real estate uh, because as the infrastructure of the record company collapses, um, you know, there is no more. There are no. There is no more money for musicians in uh, royalties. There is no more money in record sales. Mm -hmm. So the only money that there is is licensing, syncing, and live concerts, mm -hmm. teaching, of course. Well, um, and tapping into that, like talk about about cultivating an audience because I think that's so important too. Um, and I know that the Green Mill has been such a important. Landmark is uh, the Green Mills important Chicago Jazz Club, mm -hmm. and you were blessed with having this place in which you can just really hone in your craft and build almost an audience from like very very small to like people clamoring outside. Talk a bit about the challenges and what it takes to do that, as opposed to someone like a Richard Seidel, which you have a star maker. Right. behind you right. and creating this image? Well, two things. I do want to say that I, I did say yes to Premonition Records, yeah. mm -hmm. and they have done an amazing job mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. So I did have the star maker machinery behind me. It was a small record company, but boy, they really mm -hmm. did a good and job. Record. Yeah. Right. And then um, also then I did say yes to Bruce Lumble and mm -hmm. Blue Note. Mm -hmm. Both of those times I had an artistic contract that was made up by Linda Mensch, my mm -hmm. lawyer, who, where it said I could choose the material. Mm -hmm. So I was lucky enough to be a part of that system under my own terms, which is unusual. Um, so I don't, I don't want to say that I wasn't a part of that system. I did take advantage of that system. Um, and then, yes, the Gold Star Sardine Bar was where I, I was there for mm -hmm. nine years. And then Dave Gemelo called me. Uh, 
I had quit for a while. I had a very bad asthma attack that took me a year to uh, get my breathing back to normal. Mm -hmm. So um, at the end of the year, Dave Gemlo called and asked if I would like to come to the Green Mill. At the time, uh, he asked me if I would like to come on a Sunday night at 11 o'clock. Uh, so at the time, I, I did. There were two drunks at the bar. That's, that was how I started there. And uh, we started that way, and we built up an audience on Sunday nights, and it became so big mm -hmm. that I could no longer keep my back to people. So uh, then we went up on the front stage, and we included Monday nights. And then I dropped Sunday nights, and now it's just Monday nights. So uh, that, you know, in the old days, do you remember that there used to be piano players playing six nights a week? I played six nights a week at the Gold Star. Oh, wow. The challenge of that is, of course, to keep it fresh for people who keep coming in every night. But that's such a different thing than coming to Washington, D.C. or going to Paris. Because mm -hmm. it will be fresh for them, hopefully. Mm -hmm. But... It, it's it's almost like having two jobs. You have to keep it fresh for the people, the local people, but you also have to move the the art forward for the recordings and for the the big concerts in other places. Okay. Now you had mentioned earlier that you're just now becoming comfortable, like with your piano playing. It's amazing because I always thought you as an amazing pianist. Now, did you start piano was first, right? The piano was yeah. before yeah. singing. Yeah. Um, talk a bit about how a singer, an artist as yourself, accompanying themselves. Because I'm thinking like Shirley Horn used to right. be, right. I, I could never understand how she could <laughs> accompany herself in that, those tempos. Right. The slow tempos, yes. yeah. <laughs> yeah, well those are the hardest actually, that's, mm -hmm. that's true. Um, Accompanying yourself is a you know a, a definitely a, a separate thing. Uh, you know we have a long, uh, rich history of jazz pianist singers, men, of course, Nat mm -hmm. King Cole and um, Shirley Horn, uh, Nina Simone. Mm -hmm. um, but I, there was a time when I had to work very hard to keep my hands in time with the metronome, but to make sure that my voice was sp almost as if the pianist pl wasn't there mm -hmm. because the, the vocal phrasing needs to be loose and free mm -hmm. and often it needs to be in front of or behind the beat but the hands have to be absolutely in sync with the, the drummer and the mm -hmm. bass player. So there are years that you work on splitting your brain so that your hands are working with within the time and your vocal delivery is absolutely removed from that. Oh, wow. Oh. So, but I'm pretty sure that Diana Krall has had to do that as well. Oh, wow. It's a special problem of, with that. Mm, wow. And also going back to like your music, we talked about you as a songwriter, and, but you're also a brilliant interpreter of pop songs and the Great American Songbook. Um, on the Great American Songbook, are you still exploring that uh, that particular repertoire, and if so, what are some of your new finds? Or, you know, like sometimes you you have music or songs in which each time you listen to it, you revisit. There's something new that you find. Have you had that in any particular songs lately? Um, you know, I, I consider like the pop songs, the pop covers. A little bit different. I've been having fun with some of those. Um, this town, you know, the big Frank Sinatra hit. Mm -hmm. This town is fun. Um, in crowd, the in crowd. Mm -hmm. We're having fun with that one. Um, that, I would call that like a jazz rock beat. It's mm -hmm. really a lot of fun to do that. I'm also back again in enjoying Cole Porter and and mm -hmm. kind of rearranging some of uh, his music and hearing it again differently and how brilliant it is. Um, so I'm not in, oh, actually Burt Backrack. I've been, oh, I've wow. been in a Burt Backrack mood and that's been fabulous as well. Oh wow, yeah. oh, wow, wow. And here's a question which I ask a lot of singers. Has there ever been a song in which you loved but you couldn't cover? You just could not Render it, no matter how much you love, no matter how much you respect, no matter how sophisticated it was. You cannot 
prove yourself to make it yours? There are a lot of songs like that, I would say. Mm. Um, for me, I would, for the most part, I don't touch, I do sing Wild as the Wind um, because I love the chords and I love what I can do on the piano with that. But for the most part, I don't touch Nina Simone's big, biggest mm. hits. I just don't. I won't. It, you know, it's just, like you said, it's that thing and it's just, <laughs> I'm just not going to go there. Um, I also don't, I'm not going to sing uh, Strange Fruit. Mm. I'm not going to do that. It doesn't feel culturally like I, I have that history that I could possibly understand how to deliver that song. I just uh, try to stay away from those songs and write my own songs. Um, and that's an issue in jazz, within jazz, for mm. singers, I think. Mm. Oh, wow. wow. I talk to my students about that as well. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Um, I think I remember the first time my introduction to yours was not split. It was like a distortion of love. Um, the night, the okay. wild. All right. Yeah, uh, on Antilles. Right. And I remembered, and then you had, um, you did a cover of um, My Girl. Right. And I remember at. So the first uh, cover. And I remember at the Chicago Jazz Festival, you did My Girl. Then it dawned on me that you did not change the pronouns of that, of that song. Um, <laughs> and we have to do this because it's gay pride, and of course we have to <laughs> dwell into it. <laughs> uh, talk a bit about your decision to make that. That's such an artistic risk back in 92 as opposed to now. It probably still is now, but how did you decide to do that? You know, I actually, in the hotels, the first jobs that I got in Chicago where nobody heard me or saw me, I stopped changing the pronouns. Mm -hmm. You know, when I heard other singers singing about the boy from Ipanema, I just thought, how stupid is that? I really, you know, they talk about her shape. Mm -hmm. You know, and that, you know, I mean, I learned Portuguese because I love that music so much. And I just thought, that's silly. And it wasn't because I was gay. Mm -hmm. It was just because I thought it was silly. I thought, well, you know, are we all so uptight that, you know, I can't sing the girl from Ipanema. Everybody's going to run out screaming because, you know, there was that period of time. You're right. There mm -hmm. was a period of time. I remember back when that you're right. You know, straight women would be a little bit afraid mm -hmm. if I paid too much attention or, you know, and I always thought they were flattering themselves, you know, I thought, you know, <laughs> you, you know, they, yeah. they, you know, I'm sure you know. Mm -hmm. um, but that period for me passed pretty quickly. And so I never, mm. I never changed the pronouns. So my girl, I'm sure I just thought, cool, this is a cool song. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the first cover to come out for a jazz artist. Cassandra Wilson was very quick to come behind me and to mm -hmm. do that again. But I think that was like one of the first really big covers mm -hmm. by a jazz musician. Okay. Jazz musicians. Cool. That's what they say. Wow. Um, and it's interesting that the last time we saw each other was in Philadelphia at the Outbeat Jazz Festival. With, uh, right. Fred Hirsch. Fred Hirsch and uh, the drummer. Uh, it was Bill Stewart. It was Bill Stewart. Bill Stewart, right. And right. the Outbeat Jazz Festival was the first and I think only right. jazz right. festival that <laughs> paid attention to the LGBT community within the jazz world. Right. Um, Did that come and go? I'm not sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> In hindsight, do you have any thoughts on the significance of that? Because I think sometimes we're maybe too close to history to say if it was a bust or was it a... The out, was, that festival in the, particular? The, the festival and the meaning behind it, like the, the intention behind it. You know, I think that it's like we're standing in the ocean and the waves are about to cover our head with so mm -hmm. and so on so many issues right now mm -hmm. that it's hard, like you said, it's hard to get historical perspective, I think. I think find, being in Washington, D.C. is difficult. I find it hurts a little bit right now. Um, so, but to, oh, but I, you know, to go back and say, uh, jazz has been gay shy uh, with respect to men 
definitely. Mm-hmm. With real, I, I don't feel that there was, is a big issue to mm-hmm. be a gay woman in jazz, but to be a gay man is a big deal in mm-hmm. jazz. Uh, it, it has been, and I think it was the last, maybe the last bastion of discrimination. I remember walking in and my, my guys were telling a fag joke, and I said, you know, wait mm-hmm. a minute, wait a minute. You know I'm gay, right? Well, yeah, but it's different. Yeah, mm. maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe it's not different. Maybe, maybe those jokes are over. Mm-hmm. You know. So, wow. I think I think they finally are. I really don't. Mm. Th- I really think it is okay right. to be gay now. Right. I jazz. think it's, it depends. Like, um, I definitely have my allies. You know. And I'm still doing this here, so I've survived being. Well, how have you survived? <laughs> right. Survived, yeah. So. Yeah. Um, um, but I you think, know, jazz is kind of a masculine. There's a certain masculinity about it when you think of John Coltrane and you think of the the expressionism of of jazz and the 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 the, uh, the cry for equality mm-hmm. within jazz. And you know, uh, there's definitely a masculine thing about the jam sessions. You mm-hmm. know, cutting. Remember mm-hmm. the word cutting? Yeah. That means if a young jazz player gets up on the stage, you pick a tempo and a key that is so fast that they won't be able to do it. Mm-hmm. And that kind of elimination is tough. They did that to me and I cried, you oh. know, and you're, I didn't want them to see me cry, wow. and, you know. I guess for me, when I was thinking about it, it's like there was a cutting thing, but coming from the black gay experience, we also had Paris is Burning. Which was also a cutting, <laughs> right? <laughs> and right. You, no one can cut you like a black queen who's right. mad. <laughs> right. <laughs> so right. I've seen a lot of black gay men make straight men cry. <laughs> Good and for I, you. And I, Good for you. I draw power from that. And yeah. you know, people like James Baldwin and Audre Absolutely. Lorde and all of that. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, uh, but kind of tap into this. One of the things that also in the news now. Um, in the jazz world and outside the jazz world, it's a whole Me Too movement. Right. And there was all these uh, allegations uh, coming out of Berkeley School of Music about these um, aspiring music, uh, women's music students who were sexually harassed by um, teachers. How have you been able to, like, I'm not sure if you had that experience on you, but how, as a woman, as a woman who was very much her own musician, was able to go through the jazz world like that, as you? Well, you know, that was, uh, it was hard. That was awful. Mm. The whole beginning of my career was full of men trying to sleep with me. It was just very, very difficult. It was easier for me to say, I was a lesbian um, because men somehow thought that, I don't know, that gave me a superpower strength or something. Mm. Like a lot of men wouldn't, they would be like, oh, you know, like, you know, and I remember thinking he could easily overpower me, but somehow he doesn't know that now because I just said I'm a lesbian. And sometimes they would actually physically like go, you know, step back. Um, So that helped me. Strangely enough, that helped me. I had many many, of course I had many instances where people would say, if you would just do this with me, come to the sex club with me, we'd get you a record deal. <laughs> yeah, uh, we get, you know, you could you get a job at this club if you, you know, sleep with the owner, and I, you know, but I got a job there anyway, but the guy slept with every other singer, but, you know, and he and I came face to face, and I'm like, that's never gonna happen, you know, this is never gonna happen, and he's like, you know, I could hit you, and we were right in the middle of the club with all the people watching, and I said, hit me. Hit me. Let's let go ahead. Let's hit go. me, you know. And there was, and there, I don't know how, but there was some, some angel watching over me or something. It just, oh wow. I just wouldn't allow it to happen. And somehow the fact that I was a lesbian, maybe because I'm six feet tall as well, that helps. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I have to say that my musicians, uh, you know, were were helpful to me. Mm-hmm. You know, keeping those they usually the um, older guys oh. off of me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I lost every job I ever had in a suburb for that very reason. Oh, wow. In the suburbs, somehow they wanted you not just to play the piano, but to be the B girl, the bar girl. So, the, so uh, this, this type. my mother explained to me what the B girl was. So you were supposed to play the piano, and then in between you would talk to the businessmen at the bar, and you'd be drinking with them and 
whatever happens after that happens. And I never did that. I always went uh, away somewhere to read a book. Mm. And uh, I got fired from every job I had. Oh, wow. Every single job I had all around the suburbs of Chicago. It wasn't until I got into the city of Chicago that they didn't ask that of me anymore. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, wow, wow. Um, part of that, also the conversation now is we're hearing the need, and the need was always there, but you're hearing people being more vocal about aspiring women in jazz need more role models. And I think one of the things for me is like, for me as a man, I think we need to see men citing women as mentors as well. You know, and it's always about, well, my mentor was... John Coltrane. John Coltrane or Herbie Pat Hancock. Or, you know, right. How many men are, you know, we have Jesse Moran, how many people saying, my mentor was Jerry Allen. My mentor was Tyrone Carrington. Uh, I think that's going to happen. How can that not happen? I think, I think it's happening now. I think that's going to happen. I do. I, I agree with you, and I think it's going to happen because, yeah, they're going to have to say that. Uh, at some point, they're going to dig a musician enough. Mm -hmm. You know, that they're going to have to say that. You're right. Mm -hmm. Now, are you optimistic the way the jazz world has kind of evolved with women in jazz, women and gay people in jazz? Or are you still... Like me, cautiously optimistic, or are you kind of like pessimistic? Because sometimes it depends on what's going on in the world. Like right now, say three years ago, yeah, gay marriage, and now we're like, oh, the guy <laughs> won, <laughs> won because of the cake. <laughs> yeah. Um, again, I again I come to this like we're almost you know we're almost drowning in all these larger areas that uh, I actually think that that Spotify. The phenomenon of Spotify s stealing. Mm. The reason that Spotify is not in the profit zone is because they are fighting so many international lawsuits from publishers mm. and musicians. So, so many groups, not classical groups, classical quartets that you've loved for years, vocal groups, jazz groups, uh, uh, people are just packing up uh, because they can't survive. Um, so, I think that is going to turn out to be the defining issue of the times mm -hmm. for not just jazz, but for music in general, for classical music as well. And I think that the lack of historical context is, is even broader than music. I think it's, uh, I think it's going to be, uh, well, Look at the humanities. The humanities colleges are folding up. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's not just music. It's all the humanities. And so I think, uh, I think that the future of jazz is, is going to contract. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to continue to do what I'm doing, but I've always been sort of rarefied and for a special audience. And so I'm just going to keep doing what I've been doing as much as I can and how I can. Mm. Um, right this minute, uh, right these days, I'm not very optimistic about the future of music at all. Mm. I find I talk to my friends uh, who are classical musicians and they have to spend as much time explaining to the audience what they're about to sing as they do sing. Have you noticed yourself going to the classical mm -hmm. concerts that the conductors give a long talk, the composers give a long talk? There's a lot of education going on in the middle of performance, mm -hmm. much more than there used to be because there was so much education and context that came from the record stores, from the liner notes. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you pick packaging. out, yeah, you pick out a Lis Regina and you get interested in Brazilian music and you see all the Brazilian music and then boom, you have historical context. You pick out John Coltrane and you get interested in his rhythm section and you find out about Bill Evans or McCoy mm -hmm. Tyner or Miles Davis and, you know, and there isn't that mm -hmm. anymore. Wow, wow, wow. I just have one more question before I open up to the audience. Um, Sorry. No, I'm, yeah. that's, that's real. That's real. Yeah. Um, one more question before I open up to the audience. Um, and it's a bit hard, but if you could write 
the narrative of your own legacy. How would you want to be people to remember Patricia Barber as an artist? I think it's, I'm pretty happy with the way it's being written. Mm -hmm. What, with, you know, it's, it's being written for me. It's, uh, it's not plastered on, you know, big signs, but nothing right now is being plastered on big signs. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, there isn't that anymore. Um, so I'm pretty happy in, in my very specific uh, place, uh, the jazz trio, the piano, the singing, and the, and the writing, the songwriting that is um, special, unusual. And I hope to uh, be able to give some of these songs to opera singers that are asking for them as well. And for that, I have to compose a, a piano accompaniment. So if that's written as my legacy, I'm, I, I would be happy with that. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the audience? Loud mic. Yeah. What was your first experience listening to jazz? What inspired you? What was your. Oh. Okay. Um, well, I was a classical pianist at the University of Iowa, and I heard Chick Corea's Return to Forever. And um, my father had been a jazz musician, so I was well aware of the older jazz musicians. My mother's favorite singer was Billie Holiday. And my mother had a voice like Mahalia Jackson, really a very big voice, so big that I would be like embarrassed in church, you know. She was singing louder than everybody else. And she was singing an octave lower than every other woman, all the other women. Um, but I was reacquainted with it during the what they call the fusion period. I really thought that group with um, Return of Forever was, was fabulous. Chick Corea and Ayerto and Flora Purim. I loved Flora Purim's uh, uh, expression, you know, she wasn't, the Brazilian singers, interestingly, aren't always on on pitch, they aren't always in tune, The way, but but they have so much in here, so uh, that was it. Oh, I did. Mary McPartland was maybe the highlight of my career, playing on her show and then becoming friends. We became friends and we would write letters to each other and we would call each other and it was such a thrill. The phone would ring and there's this British accent, you know, it's Mary McPartland and we would chat. And uh, that was a huge part of my life. And talk about a mentor, I mean, she was so wise and she played uh, until she was 92. She, she died with her boots on, mm -hmm. yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Any more questions? Mm -hmm. uh, she's been doing some things with the Kennedy Center in terms of music and your health and all. Are you working with her on any of those initiatives? I'm not sure all that's involved. I just thought, wow, what an interesting approach. That's all, Renee. That uh, she's, you know, we've talked about that, what she's doing, but that's all, Renee. She's really interested in doing that and uh, following that, and of course. Who wouldn't want to look at an MRI of Renee Fle Fre Fleming's brain? I mean, I would, you know. What is going on in there, you know? She's incredibly smart about music and about everything, actually, but really especially about music. So, no, that's all, that's all Renee. Any more questions? No. No. I love the, I love her version of uh, the Waters of March. Uh, I love that. And I'm sorry that she flew off of a New York building. I can understand wanting to do that, but you know, yeah, yeah. A yeah. Big tragedy. It was a big, uh, yeah. Really sad. The local, uh, Ooh, the wow. local NPR station in DC, um, they used to have four hours of jazz on Saturday nights, and they recently announced in the last week that our, the local program for three hours that then Judy Carmichael's uh, piano jazz is being taken off the air. And they're saying that people are more interested in news than in jazz. But it seems like a part of the issue is that if you don't play jazz, people aren't going to be interested in it. 
And I was just kind of curious about your thoughts about how do you build up that interest um, within communities when there seems to be a, a push for whatever reason away from it. Music education, I, I think is, if you're asking me for a bright light, I, you know, I'm, I'm not very optimistic about culture right now, about the humanities. I'm, I'm not very optimistic, but if you are asking me to look for a bright light with respect to jazz and music, I would say the, um, the universities are the, are the new uh, donors, sponsors of it, and are doing a pretty good job of keeping uh, jazz in the communities and keeping uh, jazz musicians employed. Um, unlike any other time, you have the biggest stars in jazz right now taking up the teaching positions which, you know, in the old days that would never happen. They would be on tour. But now the, the biggest stars that you can think of that we have these days are, are grabbing up the teaching positions. And I think that, you know, that's, that's a bright spot. And so they are keeping radio stations alive around Chicago, and that might happen, I think, anywhere. But I, I sympathize with you about you know, losing that. Is, it's a big loss. We lost, in Chicago we lost the nighttime jazz and uh, feels to me like the city's never been as rich as it was when we had jazz starting at eight o'clock every night. What are some of the other jazz venues that you've enjoyed performing? Oh, I love the New Morning in Paris. Um, I love, uh, uh, there's a club in Oslo I love. <laughs> um, uh, you want me to talk about the United States? Uh, well, San Francisco has a wonderful jazz center there. Um, I love the Dakota in Minneapolis. I, I just love that place. Um, in New York, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, Carnegie Hall is great. <laughs> uh, uh, It's more difficult to think in the United States. I, you know, Blues Alley. Blues Alley is not. I'm. I'm not a. I've been there once. I think. Um, I'm not a. More than once, maybe. But uh, yeah. Um, it's more difficult for me in the United States to to think of places that I. For certain, like the South is just out. You know the. No, they just don't care. They, there's except for the performing arts centers, there just aren't clubs in Florida. There are no clubs in Georgia. There are just no jazz clubs. Yeah, run the wall and it's nice shugs. Yeah, yeah, so, so it's, it's easier to work in Europe than it is in the United States, I find. How important are acoustics in a venue or in a room? I mean, do you get a sense quickly when you're doing the sound check? Acoustics for me are huge. I always bring a sound man with me, and if I don't bring a sound man, it's uh, it's difficult, and I and I make a lot of uh, demands in the writer ahead of time to make sure that the, the sound. Because acoustics are everything for me. Uh, the piano, how good the piano is, how good the hall is, how good the sound man is, really huge for me. Because my music is very silent; it's very quiet. And European halls are better in that. Well, yeah, they have state support, they have government support, they have uh, very strong unions. So the, those guys are there, they are good, they are prepared, they are ready anywhere from Germany to France to Oslo to, to Spain to Portugal to, uh, to Finland to, you know, they're all fabulous. Is there an ironic that jazz is an American form in Europe? Is I think it's been that way for a long time, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. I had a, uh, the great jazz ambassadors on PBS. Right. Yeah. So. Thank you very much Thank for you. coming. <laughs>